Okay. Um, so there's been a lot of questions about the governance of the Center of Engineering Biology and of GP Wright in general. And I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, but I'm going to just tell you some of the thoughts we have around how the governance is evolving. Uh, Wilmer Hale and um, some of the people that have been working with me on this project have been working for over a year to do research on and analyze many of the large scientific uh, international projects that have happened in the past, starting with the Human Genome Project and following with a number of other uh, big projects. And so we've taken a number of ideas from there um, in terms of thinking about how GB rights should be governed and, and uh, what kinds of uh, charters and documentation that we should put in place uh, in order to move forward. And so this is kind of a just simple outline of our thinking right now. Um, the thinking would be that there would be five governance committees for GP Wright. Uh, the Scientific Executive Committee would be chaired by Jeff and George. Um, that would be responsible for creating the scientific roadmap for the project, for um, making sure that the project was achieving its milestones, for reviewing uh, and selecting pilot projects, um, and for addressing any issues of safety and compliance as they arise. Um, in addition to the Scientific Executive Committee, we're contemplating that there will be an International Advisory Committee, a Clinical Advisory Board, an Industry Advisory Board, um, and a Social, Ethical, and Legal Oversight Board. Um, and you met two of the co-chairs of that um, board this morning, uh, Je Jonathan Marino and Barbara Evans. Um, the Industry Advisory Board is something that we're going to actually start working quite hard on. Obviously, Andrew Hessel and Autodesk were instrumental in uh, providing a leadership role for industry involvement in this project. We're very happy to say that LabSite has a, a approached the project with a multi-year commitment, uh, and we are going to be um, using our best efforts to negotiate an ongoing relationship with them, uh, uh, with GP Wright. So we will be reaching out to other companies as well that want to participate in the project, whether they will be technology companies or companies that are working in specific substantive areas that are relevant to the project, like agriculture, for example, which Modern Meadow, another sponsor of this meeting, um, that's relevant to them. So uh, supporting the work of these five advisory committees would be um, seven working groups. And by the way, each of those committees would have their own charters. Uh, and so these would be drafted and commented on and formally approved um, so that everybody knows the rules and they would be put up on the website, et cetera. Um, we started the work of seven working groups last week. We had the first meeting for each of the working groups, first phone call. Many of you participated in those calls. Really exciting conversations about a, a number of areas related to GP Wright around technology development and happy to announce that Jeffrey Schloss, who led technology development for the Human Genome Project, will also be working with GP Wright, which is very exciting. Um, infrastructure development, and this has two components to it. Uh, one would be the design, test, build facility uh, platform w and make it automated to the, to the point where it could scale, and also the information technology architecture. And Chris Dwan, um, who built the information technology systems at the New York Genome Center with me and later led the Broads IT department has agreed to um, lead that effort, and uh, Jason Bobe uh, and Brian Bott from Sage Networks will also be participating in that. Um, we have safety engineering, which uh, Farron Isaacs is heading up, standards control and reporting, uh, which Mark Sallet from NIST will lead, supported by Len Friedman from the Global Biological Standards Institute and representatives from ATCC. Um, Intellectual property, there was a lively discussion um, last week on the phone. Uh, 
and we're going to be hearing more about that tomorrow from Kristen Newman, who is from MPEG LA, and Mark Solly, who has very different ideas about IP. So we had a great initial conversation about that last week. Um, public communications, outreach, and education. Um, Jeffrey Besson will be speaking on that tomorrow on the roadmaps. Uh, he has an interesting experience with the project because last year after the firestorm of press uh, publicity around uh, secret meeting creating humans um, without parents, Jeffrey actually was concerned because he is a PhD student and interested in science communications and clearly understood that something had gone awry here. And so he took it upon himself to investigate what went on and wrote the first balance piece that came out after that meeting, even before the science commentary was published. Um, so he'll be talking on that tomorrow. There was also some really interesting conversation about how to democratize public communication, to take it out in the country where people are and not just have it emanating from Boston and New York. Um, and finally, policy development, which Todd Kukin, formerly of the Woodrow and Wilson Center, will be heading up. He's now at North Carolina State University, and Gigi um, spoke in his place this morning, but she also will be working on that group uh, with Sarah Carter, uh, formerly from um, the, the uh, Ventner Institute. So um, what we're looking at and talking to uh, some of the scientists about uh, how to create is really finding a way to create a data sharing system that will allow everyone to utilize the data that's generated from this project um, and to make it freely accessible. And Chris Dwan, uh, the group had a conversation about that last week and some of the initial questions and thinking about designing a system like that. And so he'll be talking about that tomorrow afternoon. Um, funding, now that we have everyone organized uh, and proper leadership put in place, we'll actually be able to go out for funding now. We are already in discussions with several um, large funders that are interested in supporting the project with different programs. We've spoken to all of the federal agencies. We've spoken to state and local agencies. We will also be reaching out to philanthropic um, supporters and foundations in the coming months, as well as additional industry partners. But for now, um, the way that we can help all of you to receive funding is we can support any projects that you have in mind. We're happy to write letters of support and speak to funding agencies on your behalf to talk about how this relates to the broader project. Um, and so that can happen. Uh, you can either apply yourself or you can apply in partnership with the center. Um, or you can apply through your own universities, just as you always do, and we're happy to support those applications as well. Ooh. Okay. What did I do here? All right, so I just want to, um, especially for the funders that are in the room, I want to point out that a project like this has significant economic impacts in terms of taxes raised, uh, jobs created, um, people educated, and building productive futures. Um, and that will happen with this project as well. And so we're very excited with the initial interest from both public institutions and private companies in this project. And stay tuned. We're going to have some good news to share very soon. Okay, hi. Um, so a little false advertising. This is not going to be about whatever it was, road mapping or how to get money or pilot, how to evaluate your pilot projects. Instead, uh, we thought we'd just have a little fun for a few minutes. Um, so relax. <laughs> chill out. Um, we want to engage you a little bit. Um, and so 
I just thought to get a little energy going here late in the day, um, maybe we could all uh, talk about what excites us about this or one thing we'd like to see happen. And to kick that off, we're going to start and, um, and then we're going to open up to you. So start thinking about something, um, you know, let's just have fun with this. And Jeff has promised to kick it off. Yeah, so what would you do if synthesizing, assembling, and delivering DNA to your favorite organism, doesn't matter what it is, were no longer a constraint? Okay, so you have an essentially infinite resources. You can do whatever you want. This is one of our biggest challenges, but I think also one of the most fun parts about this project is no writer's block, okay? You got you got to write something. What's it going to be? So, and I don't, don't want this to be too intimidating. So, I'm going to kick it off with uh, a really fun one that came up a few months ago. I was visited by uh, a new colleague, Tim Newold, who was telling me about lupus, and he was telling me about a genomic region that always, um, that, that uh, confers risk to lupus, and it's not well understood, and it, 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 it always comes as what's called a haplotype block, it means a whole bunch of changes that always travel together. And we don't know which of those changes is really responsible for the lupus uh, um, susceptibility. And so when he heard that we could assemble large pieces of DNA and put them in, he got really excited and we started talking about doing that. But when I got really excited was when I learned one more amazing fact, which is that this particular variant of this gene is actually derived from Neanderthals. And so uh, those of us who have Neanderthal heritage may be the carriers of this. <laughs> and um, we're going to learn something about it. Over to you, Farron. OK, I guess the um, ideas that most excite me about the potential of this project, I think first is new discovery. In particular, sort of building off of Neville's talk from this morning, being able to uh, create complex genetic variation, and then elucidate um, the uh, arising phenotypes and diseases that stem, I think, will realize some of the promises and the goals of the original Human Genome Project. And then some of the goals that we had, for example, with whole genome scale writing efforts, for example, in recoding, was the unique ability, unique ability to impart new biological function. Um, so we heard examples of genetic isolation, biocontainment, I think something that I'm particularly excited about really lies at the interface of leveraging organisms that have been redesigned and recoded and interfacing chemistry and engineering to be able to develop entirely new classes of polymers and proteins that can be tunable and really establish new types of therapeutics, new types of materials um, that can really go beyond what exists today in chemical synthesis and goes beyond what biology can, can, can produce as well. Yeah, so, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, I, I guess I, I see Jeff's scenario of everything being so cheap that you, you there's a lot of pressure on you as a writer uh, uh, because it's on an exponential. And, and our experience already with the Ricoli project is the tough part is actually the testing and debugging. Um, so that fantasy of Jeff's is not that far away. And so, I'd, so I'd like to put the the uh, and I and I don't think there's much writer's block either. We could we can imagine all kinds of things we want to write um, once that becomes fluid. I think it's going to be how do we pack all the manuscripts that we want into a really tiny space? Uh, yeah, DNA. That might be a, that's a thought. Yeah, why didn't I think of that? Um, and. But, but, but in this case, it has to be DNA inside of cells, and, and in some cases, even though Jeff constantly reminds us this is all about cells, we're also doing organoids. Uh, if we want to do high-throughput testing of, say, unknown variants, we, we better be able to do organoids. And Lujan reminds us that we're doing organs and, indeed, all, all organisms in order to grow those organs. How do we compact? How do we multiplex? We have kind of a 
a running joke in my lab that's like, have you tried multiplexing? So this is multiplex developmental biology of, of large numbers of different written genomes at once in a small space. So I'm going to take this in a slightly different, is this on? Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm going to take this in a slightly different direction. So, so since starting this and for, year, for several years now, and probably you all too, I get these amazing letters from fifth graders. And they are fascinated by this. And I think back to my own experiences as a fifth grader and thinking about the big thing was how do we go to the moon and things like that. And so what I want to see is, where, and I think this will help with some of the ethical issues too in bringing this to people's homes, is I want to see it be a, a time not in the distant future where elementary schools, high schools, it's routine to think about, well, I'm going to do some DNA synthesis as a project. I know that's happening in some of our labs, but I want that to be the norm. I think it's a perfect education tool, and um, so that's my dream. Now, um, I want to see, we've all bared our, our souls to you. Um, oh, I had another dream one time, which was to make the minimal Y chromosome, but <laughs> some of you know I wanted to. to <laughs> that was, minimal zero. <laughs> well, that was the point. <laughs> it not being essential, not being essential. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that will give you the flavor. <laughs> that will give you a flavor of what you're open to suggesting. So please participate. Let's have some some. We have, you know, we got ten minutes here. Yes, in the back. June. Yes. I would like to make Lovely. Let's keep them coming here. Stand up. Stand up at least. Can you, can you, can you I would suggest we inve invest massively in automate, automated uh, bottom-up bottom -up design of DNA chunks and chromosomes. Yeah, hopefully someone's taking notes. Well, I guess the cameras are taking notes. Uh, but, but I would say that automation by itself doesn't necessarily the solution. So if you, if you have to do a billion pipettes and you a billion robot pipettes, they're not that different. But if you completely rethink it, if you go from capillary electrophoresis sequencing to next-gen sequencing, that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. And sometimes that's what happens with really good automation. I think it would be really interesting to start thinking about designing new chromosomes that basically contain the instructions to launch a genetic program once they are introduced into the cell. So I don't have like a specific idea necessarily, but essentially, for example, contain the steps that would be necessary to, for example, differentiate the um, embryonic stem cell uh, um, haploid human uh, cells that they were talking about. So there are already lots of um, examples like oscillators or you know genetic constructs that can have a certain logic, but just put these into the neo chromosomes and then just launch these programs and see whether they work or not. Also send them to space. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm a fan of survival of the species. So I would vote for uh, figuring out a way to really assimilate carbon very fast. I'd like it to be way easier to build uh, complex information processing and control circuits so that 
you know, all of these projects where if you could just get a little bit of control into the cells, you know, become easy, like the embedded control revolution we've seen in electronics. I want embedded controllers and cells to be cheap and easy rather than a whole complex research project of their own each time. I would uh, like uh, to see unicorns, but not the mythical creature, but the billion dollar companies, some real outcomes from this technology in the, in the business world. And what would, do you have any suggestions? What's the killer app? What's Morgan the killer app? Come on. <laughs> So, so in terms of killer apps, one of the things that got me actually excited about uh, genome recoding, it, honestly, initially, it was kind of a money grab, uh, that it just seemed like a grand challenge and a cool thing to do. But then I went to one of many iGEM meetings that I've gone to where students present hundreds of ideas, and, and maybe out of those 200 ideas, 10 or 20 are actually pretty good. And I would go around to the posters and talk to the students, and they would all end by saying, we engineered this organism. It would solve the problem that we want to solve, but we can't use it because of environmental issues. We cannot give it to people because then it's out in the environment. We cannot spray it on trees or treat a wheat plants or whatever they needed to do, they can't do it because of environmental issues. And I think the firewall, the idea of a genetic firewall solves that problem. And so the point is that the, there are actually well thought out ideas. And honestly, in these brainstorming sessions, people tend to say what they want rather than what they would do. And, and there is a problem of figuring out what exactly are you going to do. But actually, over the years, iGEM students have done this, where they pick apart very particular biology problems and find very particular solutions, but they all come to the same, they all hit this same wall where they can, even though they have a solution in hand, they just can't implement it. Uh, and I think the other thing that's nice about that is, is kind of a medium term thing to address is that, um, uh, is that if we wanted to rewrite millions of base pairs, it's actually v really kind of impossible to do that in any meaningful way because even, you know, people like us who, who, cons who create genetic circuits, even making 10,000 base pairs worth of new stuff that really does something novel is very difficult. And so if you wanted to, you don't really need a million base pairs worth of DNA synthesis capacity to build a whole bunch of complicated genetic circuits because we can't build anything that complicated. We don't have the building tools. We complain about how much DNA synthesis costs, but it actually costs a lot more to design a million base pairs worth of complicated circuitry. But we do have this need for recoding, which can be done in an automated way. We can get a computer to tell us what the sequence ought to be, but we still, and then we still have to make it. And I think, and so I think that one th thing is something that could drive down, it could basically create the demand for cheaper DNA synthesis that would have kind of short term or medium term real product opportunities. Okay, thank you. Um, any other, got, got another one over here. Uh, yeah, could you uh, synthesize the inferred genomes of uh, ancestral organisms and uh, use it to study, uh, to sort of play forward the table of life or also to apply selective pressure and try to um, evolve enzymes with different specificity f or different functions than the ones that, that happen to evolve through the course of natural evolution? Some people will say that this is limited to 700,000 years, which is the long, oldest piece of DNA. But other people have reconstructed um, ancient uh, enzymes and pathways all the way back to the dawn of life. Because if you've got the phylogenetic tree, now there is a lot of information that, is, that seems to be lost at our current state of ignorance, but, but there's an amazing amount of things that, is, that are not lost, and that list will almost certainly grow. I think it's a great application. There's no way. There's no way you can get that out of a out of a frozen out of a freezer somewhere. 
I love that idea, and we've tried to brainstorm about it, and where we tend to get stopped is the non-coding sequences. The proteins have enough information, but the non-coding sequences will be the challenge. I have one idea, and or like, would you like to share one? So uh, I think there's like one intriguing thing to me, and that is that although we can do all like writing and everything, we still haven't uh, solved the the one holy grail for biochemistry, and that is protein folding. So I would probably um, recode every single protein that is around in this world, and just try to find out why and how and folding works to kind of like add this type of complexity on on the writing level, which is still, I still like a very basic problem, but um, very important. I'm fascinated by the three-dimensional shapes of the chromosomes themselves, and would love to see if you did engineering and changed the shape, what sort of biological effect that would have. So we've already done some of that, uh, both advertently and inadvertently, and I can tell you that in yeast, it's surprising how much you can torture the genome with no apparent effect, um, which, which is pretty shocking when you consider uh, how complex the three-dimensional structure of the genome is in mammalian cells, and it does cause a certain segment of us to say, is that just, you know, energy minimization, or is there really some there there in terms of, you know, folding of chromosomes? Um, in yeast, maybe it's a very small number of constraints and a lot of energy minimization. Who knows what it will be in mammalian cells? So interestingly, you may, some of you may or may not know, there's a large project called the 4D nucleome that is one of these directors challenges or something and we we proposed to them that they should look at synthetic genomes off the table <laughs> so did we, <laughs> we didn't get funded either and another thing that's emerging as a possibility is, is actual visualization rather than high c which i think would be very interesting and you should set as a goal to try to mess up the chromosomes so far you've kind of accidentally messed them up maybe uh, but but at, you know, if you look at the three-dimensional structure, say, what would you have to do in order to get it to not fall, fold that way? This one in the back. Yeah, just, uh, this is a kind of comment. Uh, I would completely agree with regards to applications with the comments about orthogonal systems. Uh, I think uh, it would be, you know, if this project really wants to change the face of the world in terms of applications, then you, that is something to really work on. And uh, you could think of, you know, I haven't seen a, a lot of work of people trying to create orthogonal systems in plant cells. Um, so presumably if you could start to make um, plants that have such a system, then a lot of the worries that people have about such systems being, you know, out in the wild would go away. Cisgenics, which are the opposite of orthogonal, they're so uh, similar to existing, the existing species that they might get classified as non-regulated or non-GMO. You know, I, I love the orthogonal, but I'm just, in terms of your reassurance that the public's going to love it. <laughs> So my comments is that the completion of this project, including uh, so verification of an, an intergenic region, finishing of human genome project, so analysis of uh, so model organism, so, so including so yeast, other so organism, will result to beginning of real uh, um, personal medicine. Because, uh, because only with knowledge of all uh, polymorphism existing in so, so in population, S only uh, so knowing uh, uh, knowing so function uh, of uh, non-coding region, we can so predict so uh, uh, predict some 
therapy. So it will be new, very, very important for medicine future. Okay, I have a sign that says end. <laughs> so, um, uh, good ending. A good ending, <laughs> thank you. And um, thank you all for sharing. And hopefully, we will continue this spirit as we move forward.